Hello and welcome to Bloke on the Range. Now today we're going to be discussing a very important topic which is why Commonwealth shooters never noticed all these supposed inherent flaws in Lee Enfield rifles. And to this end I'm joined from down under, Australia to be precise, by Rowan. G'day there bloke, it's uh, great to be here and um, to all the flat earthers out there, yes we exist, the toilet does flush in the opposite direction and yes we do drink a lot of beer. But not Foster's. Not Foster's, no, never Foster's. <laughs> right, so you may recognise Rowan because he, uh, he actually participated in the October Two Gun Challenge match and was featured on, uh, on InRange. Now, uh, he actually won the World War I category in that match. Well, when I say won, he actually completely dominated and laid waste to the World War I category. Um, 55 points ahead of the next, uh, the next competitor, beat 25% of the semi-auto shooters and was only 100 points, 120 points behind the overall winner. So bloody well done, mate. Uh, it's uh, nice to be appreciated, and I had an absolute blast at that match. Ian and Carl put on a tremendous effort that day, and um, quite challenging stages with uh, some interesting rifles coming out to play. And certainly watching you, uh, watching the, the, the small amount of footage they put uh, on their video there, my first impression was, this is a guy, after my own heart, who can run a bolt action. It's a, um, a unique skill, uh, which is unfortunately forced upon us by regulation here in Australia, but... Mm -hmm. um, as a result, we've got a very long uh, history with the Enfield action in particular, uh, particularly the number one, uh, but the number four is in staggering quantities here as well, and as a result, we tend to learn to run them rather well. Yeah, I mean, a similar thing in the UK with the semi-auto ban from 1998, and plus the tradition of rapid, accurate fire in the British Army dating back to before the First World War. It kind of, you, you get a sort of cult of accurate rapid marksmanship going on there and that's ref reflected in the competition programs this is true like there's a obviously this day and age with the advances in um basically uh full ball shooting uh as it's commonly referred to obviously they've gone down the custom build actions line and uh with f-class taking off and service rifle sometime after the 1980s or 70s started spearing off um to become its own own sport here in Australia, which is quite well attended across a, a number of shooting organisations in the country, and um, the club of which I'm a member of, which is the Queensland Military Rifle Association, um, we are a little bit different even in the service rifle sphere, because we place a specific emphasis on the ability to run the gun, uh, not just prone at 300 metres or beyond, um, how fast we can run it, how fast we can use the dreaded rimmed cartridge and strip of clips. And, um, yeah, rapid acquisition, rapid realignments across multiple targets, moving targets, uh, we do the full gamut. And in the UK, it's, uh, well, it tends to be a bit more formal than that. Uh, just as I was leaving the UK, uh, civilian service rifles started to sort of come online as a, as a bigger thing. A uh, mixture of people with tactical Remington 700s with detachable magazines and, uh, and old military bolt guns, normally dominated by number fours for uh, possibly obvious reasons. Um, I mean, also I've shot I shot Franken rifle twice in uh, in IPSC matches, which was quite fun. With Twenty round detachable magazines and up close and personal stages, middle fingering it. Uh, uh, when people have never seen a bolt gun run like that, they have no conception that it's even possible. Uh, which was certainly the case at the uh, the World War One match within range. Um, people stood in awe, uh, particularly on stage three when I was triple tapping targets in the time it took them to you know, barely put one round on target. Um, and that's an acquired skill, um, unique even within Australia to actually operate with the middle finger, but um, my club in particular, we have an entire competition uh, called the World's Fastest Battle Rifle Shoot, uh, where we pitch Mauser's against Lee Enfield's, against K31's versus anything you can dredge up. And how fast can you feed that gun in three, 30 second, uh, three exposures of 30 rounds? Um, as fast as you can run the gun, and as accurately as you can run the gun. Mm. Overwhelmingly, and, uh, won by Lee Enfield. Colour me surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what we're actually going to do, at, at, at the end I'm going to put, uh, put footage of all three of Rowan's runs at the end, so, so, so hang around for that, or if we're boring you already, just skip to the end, and, uh, and be, be awed by the awesomeness of it. So, um, we're going to talk about some of the specific... Lee Enfield related myths, the supposed inherent problems that nobody in the Commonwealth had noticed uh, until US shooting magazines and the internet came along in the sort of in the, in the late 90s, early noughties, um, and sort of talk about why we never noticed these 
things. And uh, hopefully Rome will make some, some references back to the match uh, at various points. And I'll insert useful footage. So should we start with the, um, the dreaded one? Well, which one? <laughs> well, the, the most dreaded one, the, the, the headspace problems. The headspace obsession, which doesn't seem to exist anywhere else in the Commonwealth? No. Uh, just to give you an idea of how this obsession doesn't exist, uh, in the early noughties when I was at university, um, I bought an absolutely mint Mosin, M44 Mosin, 1946 dated. It had been built and then put in the grease. I've been reading magazines and, and a lot of gun writers have been going on about, oh, the first thing you do when you get a milsurp is you must check the headspace because otherwise the rifle will explode and there will be plagues of frogs descending on humanity and we'll all die. So I wander into Fulton's with it um, and I say, oh, I just got this. Could you, um, could you check the headspace on it for me? And the guy just went, why? Like, uh, to check it's safe. And he went, have you had a problem with it? Like, no, I haven't even shot it yet. Like, right, okay, take it to the range. If you shoot it, if you've got a problem, like primers backing out or light strikes or anything, then bring it back and we'll check it. But otherwise, nah. Well, yeah, across, uh, across Australia in service rifle competition, generally we're only carrying a very limited number of tools with us. Number one, front sight adjuster. Uh, made by a number of companies, or if you've got an original, that's beautiful. Um, you use it once when you zero the rifle, and then you pretty well forget about it unless you change ammunition or you uh, rebed your rifle, of course, which is another point we'll make later on. Mm. Um, the other one, which occasionally people will get because these are getting very hard to get hold of, is the stuck case extractor. For From the, the Bren gun oh, kit. Correct, and that's why they're so hard to get hold of. Yeah. Um, as a result, I've actually seen uh, a number of seasoned shooters, uh, very seasoned shooters, actually use the next ma round in the magazine as their case Ooh. extractor. Ooh, <laughs> and, this is, and this is a problem that, uh, I mean, burst, burst, burst cases is an issue with reloaded ammunition, particularly brittle ammunition like S&B. Um, the, the, the burst case extractor was in the Bren gun kit because once machine guns get very, very hot, and remember that they're unlocking with some residual chamber pressure in there, not a lot, but it's enough that if you've got marginal brass, it's hot, so the chamber's grown long anyway through thermal expansion. It, it, it can happen. It's basically unheard of with um, factory, factory ammunition, military ammunition in rifles. But to go back to, uh, to the main point on headspace, there's a fundamental issue here, which is that the SAMI no-go gauge is 71 thou long. The Commonwealth no-go gauge is 74 thou long. So you could have a rifle that was factory fresh and all, all they would do when they were head spacing these, they'd, they'd fit the longest bolt head and check it with the two gauges. So it closes on the 64 thou go gauge, doesn't close on the 74 thou no go gauge, you're good to go. That, that could be 73 thou, 72 thou, just like that because that's, that's, that's the only check they did. And interestingly, they did the same with, uh, with Springfields. They just swap out bolts, whereas with a, with, a, with a Lee Enfield, you can easily swap out the bolt head, which also helps people obsess about it because it's an easy fix. Um, the instructions of the Springfield were try bolts till you find one that closes on a go, doesn't close on a no-go, and if you can't find one, your action's probably worn, so they had these tool bolts, which you'd check with gauges, and then if, if, if that showed that the, that the action was worn, it was scrapped. And even in Australia, where uh, when the guns were surplused, normally the rifles were just laid out on a table with the bolts beside them. And uh, when said purchaser uh, paid his $28 or a, a certain number of pounds at the time, they just grabbed a rifle and any old bolt. And funnily enough, headspace issues still aren't really an issue here. Basically, unless you are getting primers backing out or light strikes when you've got correct firing pin protrusion, there's, there's, it's not going to blow up on you. Um, <laughs> Their, uh, their, their rimmed cases have a thicker case head as well, and that's something we'll get onto as the, uh, as the last topic when everyone's gone to sleep and turned off, because it's a bit, uh, bit more geeky. Well, as I said, if the first thing we check in Australia if we're uh, having issues with Lee is obviously the bore condition, because after the mm -hmm. rifles left service, uh, people stopped maintaining them, and corrosive air primers, ammunition, ate away at them in the bush in the hot tropics, which most of northern Australia is, the rifles deteriorated very quick. So we checked bore, the next thing we move on to is bedding. Uh, yep. A topic very close to your heart, as well as Berry. anyone else that takes it seriously in Australia. And uh, I think that leads into our next topic, which was the accuracy. Yes. 
Um, given that that these rifles were used in service, or, um, was, well, there were qualification courses. Uh, go look at British muzzle loaders for the, the, the musketry regulations around the turn of the 20th century. There were shoots out to 1,000 yards. By the 1909 musketry regulations, there were shoots out to 600 yards. Uh, in competition with target fettled ones, they were shot up to 1,000 yards regularly. Now, these were target fettled. They were, I mean, these are the equivalent of, of your American national match rifles, where a gunsmith, you, you've got a gunsmith practically on tap to go over them at the slightest hint of, uh, hint of trouble, just like this 1903A3 here, although this one's in military configuration. Um, and it's this, the most single important thing for accuracy for any military bolt action rifle of this era is the interaction between the woodwork and the stock and the barrel, woodwork and the metalwork. Um, and the first thing I check, and I've said this in a TFB video with the number four, the first thing I check is, is the muzzle pressure correct? Because if it's not, the chances are that it, uh, that it isn't going to shoot straight. It might, they're all individuals, but there's large chances it, it, it won't. Um, this is all lost. I mean, you go on any, any thread on the internet where someone says, I've got this number four, Springfield, whatever, um, and it's shooting 12 inch groups at 100 yards. Within about three posts, you're going to see someone saying, did you check the headspace? It's quite interesting you mentioned that. Um, you know, at the two-gun match, I had a number of people uh, who came up to me with their Lee Enfields and asked, um, could I take a look at them? Sure, which is not a problem. And you know, the first thing we do is you take your barrel, um, obviously rifle is clear, and we press up on the muzzle to check if we have any sort of upward stocking issue. And... Um, we had two that were loose, and apart from one uh, individual who had a brand new bolt with burrs all over it that hadn't been lapped in correctly, uh, and thus was wearing unevenly, mm. that was the only issue, uh, well, the only issue I had. Interesting fact, though. Both, well, the three individuals that brought their rifles up to me, all were aware that the Springfield requires careful stocking up, pressure bedding at the mu uh, towards the muzzle, but yet, the Lee Enfield is seen as some sort of dark voodoo. Um, I, I have no explanation. And the thing, the thing is that a lot of the obsession with headspace leads Bubba to do horrible things to them, like set the barrels back to fix a non-existent headspace issue. Um, now, it's a very important thing, and it's on, on, on both the SMLE and the number four, that the front sight block does not touch the front wood. Um, now, if you take a turn off of this, you vaguely see, um, I'll put some B-roll footage in of, of how much clearance I've got here. But as soon as you, uh, you take a thread off of that, A, you're not getting the right bearing at the reinforce anymore. B, you're possibly not getting the right pressure there, even, but these people aren't even aware of it. But C, you're causing the front sight protector, or on an SMLE, the front sight block, to bear on the wood. And Having had a rifle that had that issue, uh, they will not shoot straight. <laughs> Sometimes they'll well, shoot straight once they've warmed up and the, and, 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 the, and the front sight pulls away. But your first shot's is miles away. Well, this was the issue, the uh, accuracy issues that uh, you know, the rumours do still exist in Australia. Apart from the rifles not being cleaned properly uh, once mm -hmm. they were surplused off, being cleaned with steel wool and a boot lace um, was the other common practice. Um, because of the gauze that was in the original cleaning kits once that ran out. Um, these rifles were butchered and sporterized in all configurations, normally cut off somewhere about here at the barrel band to create a light and handy sporting rifle, which induced quite a lot of barrel whip. Um, I've even seen one or two that are missing the barrel retention ring itself. Um, however, Despite all this, um, this all happened because in Australia, the Leanfield was the only rifle we could get in a centerfire calibre at a reasonable price uh, up until about the late 70s. Um, as a result, it was, if you've ever seen the Crocodile Dundee movies, what's he carrying there? It's a, it's a sporterised Leanfield. Mm. And then this sporterisation, I, I think a lot of the, ac the, uh, the, the accuracy issues coming from non commonwealth countries uh, comes from A, as you say, sporterising them, which often involves free-floating them. Um, by definition, if you just hack off a number four, you free-floated it. 
Um, and also this, this presumption that a free floated barrel is better in all cases, which if any of these rifles shot better free floated, they'd have been free floated because then you can hold a much, much looser tolerance up this end and you wouldn't have to hand fit them at all. You could just literally bolt them together without any, uh, without any worries. Um, there's a reason why they took the time, and Springfields as well, to hand fit them into the stock with up pressure. And it was the 1903 Springfield that actually pioneered this. And then this ended up in the number four via the P13, P14, and so on. Um, I mean, this was an American innovation. And I find it interesting that, that you came across guys that were totally aware of this with one rifle, but then completely unaware of it um, in, uh, in a rifle that copied that stocking up system. Well, the question also has to be asked, what is accurate for the Lee? Well, they were held to a standard of, um, at the factory, off the top of my head, uh, all of the rifles shot uh, four, or four, four out of five rounds at 100 feet into a 1.5 inch high by one inch wide square. 10% of rifles were then tested at 600. And with a number one, it was nine out of 10 shots into a 24 inch circle. And with a number four, it was 18 inch. So in principle, any number four coming out of the factory should be shooting about three mower at the worst. Springfields were, I believe, shot into three inches at 100 yards. Square or circle, Which, I'm not quite sure, it shouldn't matter. And the average rifle in service rifle competition in Australia with hand-loaded ammunition and a good st stocking up without target sights, um, you know, quite regularly throwing two MOA or nudging on you know, mower and a half um, with the iron sights. Which is quite exceptional. Um, I think people overestimate what the rifles were held to. I mean, they managed to hold them in service in the manuals, uh, in testing for all the, all the rifles, including the P14. Uh, they had to shoot into eight inches at 200 yards for a mower. And if they didn't pass this, they would, be, uh, they would be sent for repair. Let's just say this is better than the German figures. I'm not gonna go into this now, but it's better than the German figures. We do not want to awaken the Gouer bears. No, <laughs> not today anyway. Um, well, the, I guess there's a bit of psychology in all this as well, that you know, an accurate man with a poor rifle will always beat an unprepared man with a superlative rifle. Absolutely, and if you don't believe that your rifle is accurate, if you don't know what it's capable of, you're not gonna try hard. I mean, if you put someone behind a rifle and tell them, oh, this rifle's a bit crap, it's only gonna shoot 12 inches, even if it can shoot four, then they're not going to try hard. They're not going to. They're not going to shoot well. And uh, I bring out my spectacular um, C19 rifle, uh, otherwise known as the, the Tika Arctic, uh, as currently issued to the Canadian Rangers. Uh, I was the first person in Australia to get this rifle accepted in service rifle competition, and they met quite a lot of resistance because it's a modern rifle. It's capable of MOA from the box with a scope on it. You can take it down to half MOA or better. But one of their primary problems they had with it was the fact that it has floated barrel and it's a semi bull barrel it's a it's a heavy shortish floated barrel however the fact is despite my superlatively accurate rifle i'm still regularly beaten by good old number fours k31s and springfields on a very regular basis and the accuracy standard on iron sights is no better or worse than anyone else can manage and uh I mean, this comes com coming back to the free floating issue. There's this presumption because because a lot of uh, rifles like that are free floated. AR-15s, even with the l thin pencil barrels, invariably shoot better free floated. And actually, if you run the maths on uh, on the moment of area, second moment of area on that, it's actually quite substantially bigger than in a at least in an SMLE because there's a much smaller hole down the middle. Uh, they're actually surprisingly stiff. Um, so people will hack will hack the, uh, the muzzle bearing out to free float. And every, every few months on, on one of the Swiss rifle forums, uh, someone will come on and say, I've just bought this, uh, this K31. When I got it home, I free floated it, and it shoots four to five inches. And everyone's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it doesn't have the correct muzzle bearing, which is based on basically the same system. Again, there's a slight difference with the, uh, the, the K31s. They only use about a kilo and a half of up pressure. And there's also clamping pressure from a bearing in the, uh, in the front handguard. But otherwise, the principle of the thing is the same. If you hack that out, and the, the, the K31 is actually point bedded at two points. So it kind of relies on the, mu on the, on the muzzle bearing to, 
to, to give it a lot more support. So you hack that out, and in most cases, unless, it's, unless the stock is horribly warped, in most cases, you, you're going to turn that rifle into something that won't shoot any better than anything else. Well, provided you've actually got quality ammunition feeding it, which, uh, shall we bring that up as the next point? Oh, yeah. Let's, uh, let's go up to, uh, up to that one. Um, do you want to start this one, then? Sure. Um, ammunition. Uh, there's been a lot about it on multiple channels now about rims and in-spec ammunition. Why do Commonwealth countries not get rim jams or see it as such a big issue? Well, um, Australia was a very late adopter of the SLR. Um, as a result, we were still producing Mark, uh, Mark 7 ammunition till quite late in the piece. Uh, this one's dated 1955, and this was still available in pretty good quantities uh, right up through uh, the early till about the early 90s. And um, an old service rifle shooter that actually got me into shooting, uh, Trevor Cook was his name, was still digging up uh, through the service rifle clubs in pretty good quantities in 1997, and um, he was still getting brass in the year 2000, um, which was obviously now hung on to like gold. Um, as a result, in spec ammunition, rim gems weren't so much a thing. You get the odd sticky charger, um, you might have a weak magazine spring. However, rim gems, the drill was there. Uh, bash forward on the bolt and it will go home. Now, the other thing I find interesting on this is, uh, I think you've done some research on this yourself, bloke, is um, Cookie, the bloke who taught me to shoot, he was a World War II veteran, Pacific, New Guinea. He um, managed to win the middle, military medal at Templeton's Crossing. Yet, in all the stories he spoke with me, everyone else, and the two other gentlemen I've met in, in my time who uh, were in the Army prior to the adoption of the SLR in the early 60s, uh, with us still trained on the 303, not one of them mentions the threat of rim jam or training a drill uh, to clear rim jams at all. Um, it just doesn't seem to be a thing. I mean, it's, uh, it's not in the memoirs. It's not in any officer's surveys on, on weapons and how they were used. Um, it's not in the manuals. And in fact, I just happened last night uh, to be flicking through Small Arms Training, Volume 1, 1924, as you do. My life is so exciting. Uh, which has the longest list of, uh, of possible jams that I've, uh, that, I've, that I've yet seen. It was by, uh, by the Second World War, it was basically defective parts or uh, failure, to, failure to take around because it hasn't popped up enough. So uh, if we just quickly go through this. So we've got jams, causes, faulty manipulation of the bolt. So user error. Dirt or oil in the magazine, which will make, it, make the mag sticky. Dirty, damaged or defective ammunition. Yep. Some mechanical defect, worn or damaged parts. And then we've got, this isn't that long, types and remedies. A, no round enters the chamber. So that's magazine column not presenting properly. To remedy, draw back the bolt, press rounds well into the magazine, releasing them suddenly, tap the bottom of the magazine sharply. Okay. So next one is bullet enters the chamber obliquely, which is clearly caused by not pushing it fully into the... Uh, into the magazine, and the, uh, the German manuals have exactly the same stoppage. So draw back the bolt, uh, pull back the round with the forefinger, and push the round back into the magazine. Yep, and that's a, more or less exactly the same as the German, uh, the German stoppage, although they say it may, be, it may be useful to remove the floor plate, which uh, I'm not sure you want to do on a two-way range, really. <laughs> um, two rounds side by side in the magazine. To remedy, push one round down sharply with the forefinger. So again, that's failure to push the rounds in properly. Damaged lips of magazine. Yep, it's a, it's, a, it's a detachable magazine. It has lips, they can be damaged. To remedy, take the magazine to an armourer. To remedy on active service, remove the magazine and with a round of small arms ammunition, lever up the lips. Okay. Uh, badly filled charger. And this is a... And I, I'd never actually bothered to try and run a charger with the rounds any old way. Because it was just sort of such a such an obvious thing to put to do them properly or to stagger them and yes if you've got got them out of order you just can't push them out they run aside from the old sticky one if they're up down up down up down or staggered then uh, it goes uh rifle half cocked remedy pull back the cocking piece empty case remaining in the bolt way 
Okay, that's a, that's a uh, possibly a, a weak a weak ejection thing. Remedy: remove by turning the rifle over to the right. Misfire, which is an ammo issue. Reload if misfire recurs. Examines striker. That's 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 it, and that's the long list. As I said, the, by World War Two, we're, we're on a much 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 shorter list than uh, than this. And one one day I'll do a, I'll do a comparison with the uh, the various Mauser jams, which. Uh, are, uh, are similar and they're quite insistent and in, I, I find it, it, it's interesting in the Mauser manual they're quite insistent that you not use violence to uh, to clear them <laughs> which is odd for the Germans but anyway I have yeah. noticed that um, uh, comparing the number one versus the number four I used in competition for the last uh, couple of years I do find the number four magazines a little more um, accepting of incorrectly loaded charges or loose strip equips etc uh, the number ones are a little little tight um, you've got to be a little bit more careful with how you lay the stripper clip together. But um, mm. it's certainly not an insurmountable problem, uh, which is a key mm. thing. And, 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 going, and going back to the sort of the, the official recognition thing, if rim gems hadn't been solved by just radiusing the corner of the rims, uh, then they would have recommended that the chargers be loaded like this, staggered, and always put in pouches the right way around so that when you grab them, they come out the right way. But they're very, very insistent. That the, that the charges be loaded symmetrically. And you, I mean, you, you need to be operating these things in a, in a soldierly fashion, and that goes for any, uh, any rifle, and we'll come on to that as, uh, in, a sec. Uh, in a sec, which is another, another topic. But it's literally, it was, it was one of those surprising things to read in, uh, in, in publications and online, was, uh, was that uh, Enfields had these horrible problems with, un insurmountable problems with rim jam, and yet, Nobody had noticed for a hundred odd years. Well, it's quite interesting that the rim jam rumours started perpetuating in Australia about the same time as the internet appeared. Um, ah. So early 2000s. Um, now, this also happened to be linked with the dying availability of Mark 7 ammunition and brass. Mm -hmm. And as a result, most brass you find in Australia is either Remington, which has a little bit of a rim, Winchester, which has... A little bit more of a rim there's a little bit of pmc hanging around which is actually made to spec unfortunately it's not made anymore and it's rare as hen's teeth and you have to like a hawk collect your brass off the range or the uh, the old codgers will steal it um and it's only the old codgers that still have mark seven in any sort of quantity um funnily enough this aligns with the sudden plentiful availability of s and b brass mm -hmm. with its non-radius edges and it's very sudden um, affordability as well. Yet, we still don't have major issues with rim jams. As, basically, correctly loaded charges, magazines that are clean and functional, and a very simple drill. Rim jam, bolt failing to go forward, bash, if it doesn't go forward and home, Press down on the magazine, close the bolt. It's very, very simple. And no stage with S&B brass, apart from some sort of error to load the magazine in the correct fashion, have I seen any sort of Dunkirk Hollywood complete breakdown. It's... I just find it hilarious that in a space of literally a decade, we have this perpetuation of a rumour that has grown out of all proportions. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and, and 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 trust me, the British squaddy will complain about anything, aside from <laughs> the weight or layout of the modern SA80. But that's a, a kind of criticising the NHS. You just don't go there. Well, our number one complaint with SMB brass is the size of the flash hole um, and the primer pocket, not the rim. And in any case, anyone who's getting rim jam, even with it, with SMB brass, if they're not using a charger, then can you not load a magazine? I mean, even with a even with a rimless. Even with rimless ammunition, it's good practice to push the rounds in a little bit forward and then push them back. It stops any risk of them them, them hooking up on the back of the on the back of the magazine. This is just this is this is an entirely obvious way to load a load a magazine with single rounds. Unless, of course, you're used to rimless ammunition or um, dare we say a Mosin with an interrupter, which works of dubious states. Some of the some of the time, if you're lucky. <laughs> Interestingly, I had two Mosins in the UK, and the interrupter wouldn't prevent. Wouldn't prevent a rim jam uh, on the top round, whether with surplus ammo or 
commercial. Um, the Hungarian sniper one I've got now, it will, and the chaps finish one will. But uh, the remedy for that, as I discovered, was you you turn the rifle, you pop the floor plate back a little bit until the until the rounds go ching, and then you slam it back forward, and then it and then it's fine. The number one issue we seem to have in QMRC with Mosins, whether they're Finnish or Russian manufacturer, is rounds ending up underneath the follower. I've never seen that one, but that's quite an, uh, quite an exciting it's quite, uh, failure. It's quite spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's like, yeah, we suddenly discovered that these rifles that, that have been used in competition with great results out to a thousand yards were inherently uh, massively inaccurate, that, that, that we had horrible feed issues with them that we never had. Um, and they had headspace problems, and this was all. This was, yeah, as you said, it was the sort of late '90s, early early noughties that suddenly we were made aware of these things that somehow, from the countries that had used these things militarily and used them a lot in competition, had never never noticed. And uh, and even into the target rifle era, when a lot of number fours were converted into heavy barrel target rifles, and I've done a video uh, on a particular example of one of these, um, there was a belief they shot better at long range than the P14 M17 and Mauser 98 conversions, and that the, the front lock has shot better at close range. And this is entirely psychological, to be honest. Um, the two absolute highest possible scores I ever saw in, in my target rifle era, which were shot with a converted military rifle, one was with an M17 at 300 yards, and the other one was at 600 meters in Canada with a Whitaker Special number 4, so a, one with a butt socket cut off and in a, and in a single piece stock. Um, but, I mean, none of these old military actions can, 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 can keep up with the modern, heavy, rigid, three, four lug accuracy machines. Yet our club veteran at QMRC shoots the Queens every year and managed a medal at uh, 800 yards. Nice. <laughs> nice. With his number four with tar uh, the Park Hale target sites. Just a, a basic your standard number four? Yeah. Not, not even heavy barrel conversion? Well, it had a... A lithgow. Well, it's had a heavy, uh, a heavy military spec heavy barrel in it, but that was it. Okay, <laughs> cool. Right. So, shall we move on to your big bugbear, the manual, the manual of arms, and how basically the, the crux of this video: how to run any bolt action, but particularly a Lee Enfield, fast, like you mean it. Yes. Well, that seemed to be the key difference uh, between myself, my uh, my good friend Dylan, who was there shooting the match with me. Um, we seem to have an entirely planetary different uh, method of operating the Lee action. Um, you know, Dylan is a predominantly a pistol shooter, not a particularly strong rifle background, however, was operating the Lee in a, well, in this case, an Isha 4, borrowed from Carl, in a fast, repeatable, and soldierly fashion. Now, that could be because he's ex-defense, or it's because maybe that's just the way we're taught down here. <laughs> now, moving on from that point, pet bugbear of yourself as well, operating the rifle at the shoulder, allowing you to maintain a sight picture, or dropping it from the shoulder, operating the bolt, and coming up. Which one do you think allows for a greater speed? <laughs> yeah, I mean it's 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 fundamental. Whenever I've shot, whenever I've uh, done IPSC coaching, whether pistol or rifle as well, um, the 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 message is always eliminate unnecessary movement. Pistol, revolver, rifle, um, semi-auto rifle, bolt action rifle. Unnecessary movement is costing you time, and this goes for for everything and. Uh, they were very insistent in the manuals about operating the bolt in two smooth movements. So, bang. It's not four movements, it's not. And, then, and people who complain about feeling the springs on these, if you operate this in a soldierly fashion, according to the manual, you don't even feel the spring because you are smacking that thing extremely hard in a forwards direction. And uh, it's, it, 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 it's not that, it's not overly strong a spring. But uh, you, were, you were telling me before about uh, seeing people operate it in like five or six movements uh, and struggling against yes. the spring. And yeah, forward, fight, down, to the trigger. Fire the action, 
I saw then up, back, forward, fight the spring, down, and fire. It, with the palm of the hand, it, you just did with it the palm of the hand. It's it's there seems to be I don't know whether this is a, a cultural thing. Um, is it a Mozin uh, thing? Is it the well? Is it it the, could just a cock on open a cock on opening thing. I, I don't know. But but then a spring a Springfield because it has a fairly uh, fairly weak mainspring compared to say a K ninety eight K. You can finger and thumb these quite quite happily. And that is the key difference. It's all in the wrist. I mean. The manual states in a smart shouldery fashion. You can get a quick march cadence with this. Yeah, left, right, left, right, left, right. It's it's designed to be run that fast. Um, as is often yelled on many a range, if someone's having trouble, treat it like you hate it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I get, I got some hate comments a while ago on on, uh, on one of my Lee Enfield videos. Someone someone complaining that I was treating the rifle too roughly. It's not your girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, don't baby it. It, it, it. If you ba- if you baby it, re- un, un, it's not designed to be babied, and that's when you, you potentially get rounds jump. Potentially, if the magazine lips aren't quite right, getting rounds jumping places they're not supposed to go. But it's designed to be operated in a soldierly fashion, in two movements held between the finger, forefinger, and thumb. Um, and I, I was discussing with somebody that perhaps this palming thing comes from a lot of people having reasonable amount of experience with mozins because they're cheap um, and that sometimes you need to give that a good slap with the palm of your hand simply because there are the bolts are rough generally and they're um, and the primary extraction is really poor and the cases are often steel and sticky and and so you got to you got to give it some uh, some persuasion to get it open it's a bizarre thing um, moving back to leaving the rifle on the shoulder uh, when operating the purpose of your follow through release the shot and follow through reset the trigger regain the sight picture and realign on that target or the next that is the purpose of the follow through how are you meant to achieve any of these if the rifle has already left your shoulder and you've started working the bolt yeah I, well, is that is that that thing about i mean re- having to reacquire a target being absolutely obligatory with a bolt action is not Exactly the case. Okay, there's more movement. Let's 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 compare like with as like as possible. So take a number four versus an M1. M1. The machine that goes ping. The machine that goes ping. Uh, so you've got aperture sights in both cases. There. Well, the M1's a bit heavier, uh, but it's semi-auto. And yes, you can bring bring that down a bit more easily. But when you're working the bolt on the number four, even if you can't keep your eye exactly on the site. You can keep it close enough to the site so that once you close the bolt, you're basically back on, back on target anyway. And the ideal situation, they bang on about this in the, in the manuals, is being able to operate the bolt without moving, without moving the head. So you don't need to fully reacquire or fully, fully remake your position. It's not, it's not like uh, uh, firing in ranks, uh, Zulu war style. So present! Oh, acquire target. Aim, fire, boff! Present. Where you're having to do everything, you're having to do the whole shot cycle from the ground up every time. Whereas if you keep it up, you acquire your sight once, it's going to recoil, you, you're ba- and by the time you're back down, you're back on. And in my mad minute, um, the M1 on the splits was about 30% faster than, than the number four. And yeah, you want to have that 30%. I'm not, going to, I'm, I'm not going to turn around and say that that's a better battle rifle than an M1. That would be silly. Um, but this idea that you have to r- sort of rebuild your shot and your position, and, 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 and if you're a good shooter, you're, you should be con- very, very conscious of your natural alignment. And that's something I saw going through the footage of your, your runs on the, uh, on the Two Gun Challenge match, is when transitioning from one, one target to another that's widely spaced, you pivot around your elbow. When you, you were, you Fundamental were rule of marksmanship. Position and hole must be fair enough, support yeah. the rifle, and the Absolutely. rifle must point naturally at the target. Or I think the Americans use the term natural point of aim exactly. in their, uh, their teachings. But um, you know, it's, mm. you know, the Lee Enfield is pretty much designed so the bolt will not hit you in the face. Um, the C19, depending on how you have the stock spaces arranged, the same thing. It's not going to hit you. The Springfield is close, 
but just short enough. Yet the K98 I owned belted me in the nose something chronic. I had a nosebleed for two days. Ooh. Yeah. Well, the other the other the other problem with the K98 is that if your sights are set at a low low elevation, which they will be for most shooting, uh, the bolt handle obscures the sights. So you, you you can't physically, even if you wanted to, you can't maintain a sight picture. You can you can sort of track the front sight and keep it vaguely vaguely aligned, but you can't you can't really track it properly simply because there's something in the way. And this is a major flaw. Well, the, with a sticky out bolt handle, it's even worse because you you you've got to bring your your fist in front of your face as well. I don't. I don't think I own here. any. <laughs> um, no, uh, my my Mosin's a sniper, so it's, it's turned down. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's something they got right on the Springfield is that you don't obscure your sights, at least in this one. Um, no, I mean this this one I had to. This is a this is a factory uh, reefer post-war Smith Corona, and I had to reset where the rear sight cradle was, and still I have to crank the thing over to the left. Um, if the sight was further to the right, it would be it would be obscured well, a bit. So the key difference really comes down to supporting the rifle. If you support the rifle well, A, you're going to ride the recoil mm. better, you're going to be able to realign on your next target better, you're going to be able to manipulate the rifle faster in that smart military manner. And the other one is you can also load the rifle better. If it's loaded on the shoulder, if you're prone, you can drop it to the ground and provide support. It's about supporting the rifle. Now, there's some great footage uh, in my first stage, uh, the World War One match, where I'm, I have the charger in my hand as I'm running. I then take a knee and proceed mm. to load. These are dummies, by the way. To then load the rifle from the kneeling, which has totally baffled the RO because he thinks I'm going to engage from the kneeling position when it's supposed to be a standing shot. You can hear him saying, standing, standing, standing. I then stand and take the shot. And mm. the only time this rifle came out of my shoulder was for the reloads. And that was then perpetuated again in um, stage three, where demonstrating the middle finger technique, um, you know, triple tapping targets instead of double tapping, purely for the entertainment of the crowd. Um, again, I dropped kneeling for the load in order to support the rifle so it's not moving around while you try and fight the charger into the bridge. Yeah. I also, I also noticed that you were... You were uh, benefiting from the oft-forgotten advantage of the ten-round magazine, which is that you don't have to wait till you're empty to. to and chuck using in a, a sling charge. seemed to be a rare thing at the match as well. <laughs> you see, that, that's funny because in the, in the U.S. military manuals, they're yeah, all the they're British all wasn't. about the sling, and and then uh, <laughs> oh, the British were you will not use the sling aside from in competition. Um, it was it was um, it, it has no it has no place on the battlefield aside from to carry the rifle. And there's a, uh, there's a sort of lessons learned publication uh, with the US, and there's some young officer complaining that uh, soldiers were not using slings even when they were in positions where they could have used them. Um, and then in fact, the first shots fired, I believe, on the, on the training range were fired sling supported, whereas the Brits fired with a wrist, uh, wrist supported on a, on a sandbag. But I mean, certainly I can understand why. In a combat situation, you wouldn't want to tie yourself into into the rifle, which might limit your ability to move it, engage a engage a surprise target from an odd angle or something like that. But certainly on a on a competition range, you haven't got anyone firing back. Well, even against the clock, you can so move your body not? faster than you can swing the barrel. Yeah. So I mean, I actually used a sort of jury rig single point sling, it's actually an M16 cloth sling on a hook uh, when I shot Franken rifle. We had we had a couple of uh, Four inch plates or four inch tiles at about 100 yards, um, and I had a red dot sight on it. And it was the first shots uh, of the stage, so I hooked myself up with the, with a single point sling on a hook. Got it up high, drop prone, nailed those uh, nailed those targets. Stood up, and because everything else was close up, as I was running the 20 odd yards to the next firing position, I just unhooked the thing and threw it on the ground. Obviously, obviously, that's 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 not a militarily appropriate thing to do. But in terms of uh, in terms of sports shooting, that was uh, that was my Water solution. <laughs> um, mm. Do we have anything else on manual of arms? I think we've put that to the the general point is if you're not using something 
the way it's supposed to be used, you're not going to see the benefit of it. So fundamentally, there is no difference in speed between that rifle or this rifle or a sticky out bolt handle if you're not holding it up in the shoulder and keeping it there. So if, you, if you're doing all this unnecessary movement, and occasionally you get people coming up and saying, oh, well, I find, uh, I find uh, sticky out bolt handles to be faster. And I think, you're not cycling it in the shoulder then, are you? Oh, yes, I do, I do, and I'm palming it. And you should be able to cycle the bolt in two seconds. Like, mate, I've got videos up where I'm doing, I'm doing uh, well sub two second splits. Well, the general consensus among uh, for my club is that, yeah, sticky handle bolt handles work really well on Mausers because of the cock on open to overcome that initial pressure. Um, after that, well, once you take the, mo uh, the, uh, the Mausers out of the equation, there's not really not much left. <laughs> yeah, Mozins, which are just rubbish. Garbage, rubbish. Um, yeah, there's some Manlicker turn bolts, which they're even worse, they're even further forward because they're split bridge. And they're like, why, why? why? Um, and I, I suspect that, uh, that the sticky out bolt handle stuck around for Continental uh, infantry rifles because of well, sticky extraction, fighting the spring, and not keeping the rifle in the shoulder. I, th I think that, that they were not thinking of that kind of shooting uh, until relatively late. Now, in the, uh, the second, pre second World War era manuals, they talk about reloading in the firing position, which I take as meaning reloading in the, in the shoulder which you can with a, with a turn down bolt handle quite easily, but with a sticky out, you're fighting it, you're, I mean, palming, palming is a valid technique under those circumstances. Well, I guess the whole thing with manual arms and uh, your initial plan to link to uh, commercial catering equipment. In Australia, we learned to use what we had um, mm. and because other rifle types and action types were not available for sporting purposes, hunting or uh, target shooting until the late 70s. We learnt to run the Enfield very, very well, uh, be it fast or we learnt to do it accurately. Um, and as a result, that still sticks around to this day, just like... You know. But yet, that translates to other types, whereas we see some countries, they know their rifle type only and everything else seems to be beyond them. Mm. I mean, the, the, Swiss, the Swiss know the K31 and specifically the, the, the long... 11 and uh, 96 11 um, but their their idea of rapid fire doesn't go beyond six rounds in a minute which uh, which is leisure is, is is leisurely I mean I've, I've shown several uh, several times shooting the Felchison and uh, yeah that, that, that minute takes quite a long time for just six rounds I mean it gives you t it gives you time to rest it, you can you can remount you can... what was it you said with the uh, with the the high power and national match type shooting. Uh, the NRA high power match, which we shoot a variant of here in Australia, the, and it's the same in the States, the 300 metre rapid um, is 70 seconds, 10 rounds, including your reload. It, it's quite leisurely. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm sure if you get flustered or have a, or, 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 or screw, up a, screw up a charger or something, that, that suddenly that 70 seconds can, can, can whittle away Disappear. rather rapidly. Um, but under normal circumstances, with a with a reasonably slick reload, that's 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 it's a timed precision, time deliberate. Yes, yeah. All right, shall we move on to um, the last ac one? Strength of the action. Yeah. Yes. Right. We are going to move on to on to this. There's some interesting engineering and physics out there, uh, but uh, this is an interesting point. Um, okay. So I'm just going to read the whole thing from the, uh, the uh, textbook of small arms. Practically all military rifles are at least twice as strong as they need be, and many of them are ten times as strong. One great reason for this is that the cartridge case itself, when free from grease, grips the wall of the chamber very tightly on firing, and so relieves the deadweight thrust on the bolt head. This is very clearly shown when using the oiled case me method of pressure taking. The Mark VII cartridge is specified to give about 19 tonnes per square inch. If, however, the case is not dipped in oil, it registers only about 10 or 12 tons per square inch. A little aside, um, the pressure measures, measurements they used at the time were what's called an axial crusher, where you use, basically use the cartridge case as a piston, and it pushes back on a, uh, on, a, on a breech block, and then that 
crushes a piece of copper and you measure how much that's crushed and from that you can get the pressure back. The proof cartridge for the 303 barrel is specified as about 24 tonnes, yet fired without oiling the case, it, uh, it registers much less pressure on the bolt head than the service cartridge properly oiled. It is therefore most necessary to remove all grease from the chamber before, before beginning to shoot if the action is not to be strained. Okay. This is where it gets interesting. As is well known, the SMLE has a rear locking bolt, and this is often supposed to be a source of weakness and possible danger. And this is actually, another tangent, um, this is all propaganda from the, from, from the, turn, of the turn of the 20th century uh, leading up to the P-13. There was a massive faction in the, the British military and in, in the shooting hierarchy who thought that the short rifle was, uh, was not accurate enough, and they basically wanted a Mauser-actioned uh, uh, target rifle capable of, uh, of a body shot at 1,000 yards, which is, with hindsight, completely no. silly. Um, but a lot of this propaganda from this era is still common currency 100-plus years later. But it is often overlooked that the cartridge is rimmed and not a rimless cartridge. As a necessary result, there is much more metal in and near the case head of a Mark 7 cartridge than there is in a rimless case. The rimless case has a deep groove cut in it for the extractor, so that the floor of the inside of the case head is really only just inside the walls of the chamber. A stretched action or a badly fitting bolt head with a rimless cartridge may easily allow the floor of the case to be outside the chamber. If so, the cartridge case fails badly and allows a large rush of high pressure gas to escape and wreck the rifle. Such a casualty is almost unknown with the SMLE except when the cartridge case itself has a bad floor in it. With good cases, the SMLE can safely fire a few rounds at as much as 30 tons per square inch pressure, whereas hardly any rifle using a rimless cartridge can stand one round at such an excessive pressure. Now that's SMLE, not the number four. That is the, the famously weak SMLE. And this is something I'm going to do. I'm going to section um, some 303 cases and some 7.5 Swiss because uh, these are these are mid slash rear lockers, so we've got an exposed, easily visible chamber, and I will show exactly what they mean by that at another time. Quite interesting, because we spoke about um, separated cases before, and uh, you know, weak brass or uh, corroded brass, in many cases, people are still using vintage ammunition. But um, where cases separate on the 303 is usually right about there, which is basically where the thin cartridge wall starts, because there's quite a lot of brass up around that case head. There's an awful lot of brass up against that case head, and in fact, some of the um, uh, some of the Nitro Express cartridges that were sized for SMLE actions, they they're they're pretty chunky, uh, pretty chunky cartridges. Well, um, I know several people in Australia that have built uh, you know, 35 caliber 303s, um, a two and a half inch 375 Nitro flange, I think it was called, and um, you know Australia the the quintessential scrub rifle or bush rifle was a 25 303. I mean, we we necked the 303 case up and down from 22 caliber to. Well, my mate built a 45 70 variant uh, with the rim turned down and put that at a number four action. I mean, uh, if you number four action in particular, um, you know, it was converted in the L42 you know, marksman or sniper's rifle to handle 762 NATO. I mean, that's a that's a massive pressure difference if we go to skip copy units and move straight to PSI, we're talking 60,000 PSI plus mm. uh, for 762 NATO versus the relatively mild, but though check the difference between CIP and SAMI for the maximum pressure of the 303 case, which is uh, by CIP is listed as about um, 53,000 or 53,900 PSI. Mm. Interesting that SAMI again downrates the cartridge, just like they're well, I wonder if they're gauges. not downrating it to, to crack because the, the, the Sami 303 no go gauge is the same as the crack no go gauge. And I'm wondering if the, they just didn't. Because you see occasionally that, oh, 303, it's a, it's a, it's a 30 crag uh, level cartridge. Well, 303 marks, marks 1 to 6, yes. But Mark 7, the Spitzer cartridge, is a different beast entirely. And that's not even mentioned Mark 8. <laughs> yeah, which they will handle it um, as well. Um, in, it, it, Mark 8, because it's a boat tail, doesn't run well in, um, uh, in cordite worn throats. And uh, that, I believe, is the official reason why you weren't supposed to use it. But of course, as soon as you've got squaddies told not to do something, they'll do it. Yeah, yeah, more range, more range, more range. <laughs> it did give less flash. So there's actually a, a reference in, in one of the ammunition manuals about using it in rifles and brain guns at night to give less flash, because cordite is flashy, and Mark 8Z is, uh, is not just cellulose. I mean, we've spoken about all these. 
303 variations and just how strong and the various pressure differences. I mean, if we're, rear locking actions are so weak, um, my newly acquired SSG-69, um, you know, arguably the first purpose-built military sniper rifle. This is the, the P, P2 model, P2K, uh, so the police variant. Um, you know, designed to handle 7.62 NATO all day, every day. Shoot out-and-out accuracy machine, hammer-forged barrel, uh, you know, lovely small ejection port, so uh, maximum action strength. The barrel is press-fit to, uh, to the action. Yet, what do we have? Rear locking lugs. <laughs> yep, which means a short action throw, which uh, is, is yeah. useful. And a 60 degree bolt throw, which funnily enough, with this large bolt handle, or even the original spoon bolt, places you right at the trigger. Yep, it's swept back just a little bit to put it in the same position as a Lee Enfield. Uh, don't quote me on the uh, the original um, you know, P1 variants, but um, yeah, this P2 definitely is swept back. The originals had a, had a spoon handle bolt, much like a Manlicker. But oh, I mean, okay. Steyr were, they were manufacturing you know, the K98 action in the 30s and 40s, and much later than that as well. Yet in 1969, when they put this together, still chose a rear locking action in an out and out accuracy machine. And their sub half, well, we have we have one as a club gun uh, set up as a target rifle, and it was a sub half mower gun with, uh, with tuned ammo. But yet rear actions are so weak. <laughs> I know. It's, I mean, the thing is, if you, and geeky engineers and stuff come out, you, you, you resolve the forces. You don't generate extra stress by having extra length there. What you will generate is a little bit more more setup on firing because it's a little bit more elastic, but in reality that doesn't seem to make the blindest bit of difference. And in fact, um, the the number four conversions to 7.62 target rifles, they will happily pass a 20, servi 20 ton service proof for the, um, uh, for the 155 grain ammunition, quite happily. I mean, the, the, the thing is that the, the, the well, British, uh, National Rifle Association were all had had been hearing all these action weakness things. So we recommend if you've only got a 19 ton service proof uh, in there, getting it reproofed for 20. Um, and of course, they're not failing. And no, they're all proofed to 24 ton. I mean, it's, I had a Parker Hale um, sporting gun as a hunting rifle, which was proofed 24 ton with a short barrel. I mean. Yeah, on a, a number one action, <laughs> a twenty, a, a, a twenty-four ton service service load, so a, so a proof proof pressure of twenty-five or whatever percent over that. It's um, it, it's just just ridiculous. But the other thing is, if 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 they're so weak, where are all the pictures of exploded ones? Well, yes, that's quite a point. I was doing some research on this a while back, trying to find pictures of of uh, SMLE kabooms and number four kabooms to try and look at look at the the mechanism how they failed. And the only picture I could find, and I asked around quite a lot, was an SMLE where a round of armor piercing ammo entered the muzzle, the core, the jacket was left in the muzzle, the core separated, went down the barrel, slammed into a round of Mark 7 that was in the chamber, and blew it up. The bolt held, well, the lugs held, the bolt is cracked through, sort of diagonally, and the, uh, the chamber blew out. So the the, 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 the the barrel the bolt cracked and the barrel failed. The lug, the lugs held. Apparently well, the gun walked away from it too. The number one and number four is exactly the same, it's even meatier. If it's going to fail, the only place that pressure can really go is out that way, away from the shooter's face. Um, it might bow the the main side of the action here, but it's it's locked at the rear and the rest of it all that steel up forward is going to deflect those gases. I mean, I, it truly really is quite baffling. I mean, the AR-15 is designed to fail outwards um, in a very similar manner. Mm. And quite interesting, again, the rifle I was using at the World War One match was an L2 Isha 4. The number one action, just made with slightly better steel and some fairly interesting tolerances. But that's a whole different point of story. But... Indian manufacturing, but it's still at its core the number one action, not the number four, the number one. Um, you know, Australia experimented with trying to fit 7.62 in the number one action. Um, you know, that just got bypassed and went straight to the straight to the SLR. But um, again, if it, it's not recommended that we chuck 7.62 in these, 
but it can certainly be done in the number fours. And the, I mean, the other, the other thing is that uh, that the Turks converted a whole bunch of SMLEs and long lees um, to eight mil Mauser. Ah, captures from Gallipoli in the desert, of course. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And okay, it's not the, it's not the, the, they weren't using the heavy, the heavy, uh, the heavy spits of bullet in them. It was still the 150 odd, 153 ish grain uh, light ball in that era. But uh, it's like, where are the pictures of these blown up rifles? You can you just type Mauser breach explosion and you get all sorts of, particularly 93s, the Spanish ones. Or 90 yeah. Yeah, but, um, Turkish ones. The, if there are any kick around Australia, I'll guarantee it's some scrub rifle or someone who's plowed it in into the bush and yep. filled the, the barrel with dirt. It's, it's never an ammunition fault. Yeah. I mean, we were, Australia was renowned for producing extremely high-quality ammunition, as was all the Commonwealth nations. Oh, that's an interesting aside, is that the Germans had special sighting in ammunition and special sharpshooting sharp ammunition. The Brits just issued Mark Seven for everything, for competition, for normal infantry use, for sniper use. Um, it was a generally high, high standard of ammunition across the, across the board, certainly compared to, uh, to the Continentals. Well, yeah, you know, the fact that we retain brass cases till the very end <laughs> yeah. is a fairly good indicator. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, can you? Uh, well, it does come up in memoirs a bit of uh, of German soldiers late war. Um, well, they any any brass cased ammunition that came up uh, up to the line, they'd uh, reserve it for the machine guns. So uh, poor saps with with one of these and lacquered steel, Bat battering the bolt open. Uh, Open on, on, on sticky steel, particularly once it gets hot and the and the lacquer starts to melt and, and stick to the chamber walls. You've not got much lever lever arm on these. They're pretty short bolts, and uh, you're probably allowed to beat it on a rock. <laughs> yeah. But you would have done though. But, uh, yeah, and as I've shown before, the primary extraction on these is an issue. Primary extraction with good ammunition isn't an issue at all, anyway. Um, mm. um, just as as a as an aside, friend of mine. In Denmark has a has a Steyr Scout in 308, and with factory ammo it was it was beautiful. But with some Danish uh, 762 NATO surplus in it, it had basically no primary extraction because it was designed around quality, high quality brass. Now we're probably going to cop some flack again about the Springfield on this because it is quite easy to lift the bolt handle on the Springfield regardless of load. And uh, I think you might have worked that out. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's compared to the the Mauser 98s, it's got a fairly weak main strength because it's got second strike capability. And if you want second strike capability, you can't have a massive, massively powerful uh, mainspring in there. Um, the issue I have with this rifle is that during refurb, it was parkerized to death, including the bolt. Uh, including the camming surfaces on the bolt. So this has horribly sticky uh, primary extraction. And I have filmed a mad minute with it and I was disappointed because I was having to work it a bit hard. But what I'll do is I'm gonna polish that off and polish the, the functional surfaces on this bolt just to get rid of that nasty parkerization. Do the same in the receiver. Get in there with, with a piece of wood with some lapping compound on it. Polish up, polish up those cams and then we'll do it properly. Because of the Mauser type rifles, of the cock on open Mauser type rifles, this is my favourite. Best of breed. <laughs> very, very much the best of breed um, by miles. Not only because of the stocking up pressure. In fact, I, I uh, got to choose between three or four of them, and this was the only one that had up pressure at the muzzle. The others were bearing in horrible directions, and I was like, ooh, no, not spending patron money on, on that one. I know that it's not going to shoot straight. Well, um, funny that we mentioned best of breed as well, because um, I know that uh, we were both looking at some uh, old footage from the early adoption of the SLR in the British Army. And uh, obviously the rate of fire comparison inevitably came up, and um, that included the number four versus the SLR. And I think the squatty was probably told not to give it his best. Yes. <laughs> he, I mean, he was, he was working the bolt in a very, very soldierly fashion. Um, correctly, but then was doing this massively long pause and aim, which was possibly told to, mm, yeah, slow ball it a bit. Go for accuracy. Well, I think that works through most of the points. We had um, the differences between the uh, the Commonwealth and the, the British Empire at large and um, the rest of the world and the Lee Enfield. Yeah. Oh, by the way, the Germans seem to quite like, uh, like Lee Enfields as well. 
um, I'm on a few uh, German ordnance waffen uh, pages on Facebook, and they uh, they seem to generally like them. Particularly the brand spanking new uh, number four Mark IIs from the 50s. They uh, they go down rather well. You know, they often post pictures of very quite impressive groups with actually five or eight or ten rounds in them, not just three. <laughs> It'll yeah, be quite interesting to see what the Canadians do now that the Rangers have surplus their uh, their number fours to adopt these newfangled tickets. It'll be interesting to see what um, what condition they're in, how well how well the uh, the military system was was maintaining them with respect to stocking up and things like that, or whether they were just no, nah, they're, they're 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 obsolete. They're going out anyway. We'll just uh, as long as they go bang and shoot all right for standing, uh, who cares? Minute of polar bear. Anecdotally, uh, they have seen a lot of lot of use, a lot of wear, and there's a lot of cannibalisation of parts going on. But their ammunition is still coming new from the factory. So yeah. someone needs to get hold of uh, a certain Canadian to obtain some in-spec Mark VII ammunition. Yes, and uh, do some tests. I'm sure he would, uh, he would love to. <laughs> so, well, this has been about an hour. So... Uh... I've really enjoyed it. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's been uh, really interesting. I hope uh, everyone who survived this far uh, thinks so as well. And uh, as soon as we've signed off, I'll put the three, uh, the three two-gun challenge stages one after the other unedited so you can uh, see Rowan's extremely uh, excellent runs there with a slightly iffy Ishapur 2A1. And, it did have uh, quite a lot of sand in it. <laughs> hmm. You'd think that possibly they may have dumped it in a sand... Bucket uh, one bucket. time to <laughs> test it. <laughs> so, thank you all uh, very much for watching. Thank you so much, Rowan, for agreeing to do this. And the, with, the, with the, the time zone difference between the two of us, uh, it's uh, evening there and it's morning here. So I uh, hope it's worked out. I hope uh, we, can, uh, we can possibly do this again on some, some other topics. For instance, your, your C-17 rifle. Um, C-19? C-19, sorry. <laughs> C-19 Project rifle. Project started in 2017. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so thanks everyone for watching. Uh, thanks to the patrons who support us and give us the impetus to spend a lot of time doing this kind of thing and uh, pay for all the ammunition that, uh, that we shoot in our videos. And uh, if you're ever over here in Switzerland or in Europe, let me know and uh, we'll try and arrange something. Likewise, if you're an Australia bloke, we'll uh, hope to see you soon. <laughs> Cheers, mate. See you again. Bye, guys. Gotcha. Very nice. Yeah, that's what he was telling me before. Very, very nice, man. How'd that feel?
Sorry. No right through Impact. 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 That looks way right. Impact. Low. Impact. Need one more on that. Don't forget the safety cap. Good God! Ready? Ready. Stand by. Unload and show clear. Well done! Round. Damn, well efficiency! Ball forward, hammer down. Perfect. All right. Very, very, very nice.